Welcome to the Mind Vine Podcast, where we challenge the stigma associated with mental illness through conversations about a variety of issues impacting mental health. Here we bring you news, views, and interviews that intrigue, educate, and celebrate recovery. Leading us on this journey are the hosts of the Mind Vine Podcast, Daryl Mathers and Chris Bovey. Welcome to the Mind Vine Podcast. My name is Daryl Mathers. I'm with my co-host, as usual, Chris Bovey. Chris, how are you? Good, Daryl. Uh, I've been hearing that they're going to open up the golf courses, maybe, and make an announcement the next day or two. So I'm excited to uh, wreck a few golf courses, maybe, in the next. I didn't day. even hear that. That is my. That is the best news I've had. <laughs> I've heard all day. I did not even. It did not come across my radar today. So thanks for bearing good news. Uh, yeah. Lots. I'm really excited about today. Um, our guest. For, you know, for a couple of reasons. One, we're approaching Mental Health Week, and we've got a few of these podcasts, including this one, coming out to kind of capitalize on the momentum and awareness uh, that National Mental Health Week brings. But um, our next guest is uh, somebody I grew up watching and, and being a, a fan of, and he's got quite the lengthy bio, but he, you'll know him as Shane Corson. He's a mental health advocate. I want to say that first. He's a mental health advocate. Uh, he's also, he also spent 19 seasons in the NHL with Montreal, St. Louis, Edmonton, Toronto, and Dallas. I don't think I missed anything. And uh, he's uh, an, a former Olympian, played in the World Juniors. Welcome, Shane Corson. Hey, thanks, Daryl. Chris, good to, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Now, the Did biggest... my mom write that for you, Daryl? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I'll take any help I can get. Yeah. Uh, but the biggest compliment I can pay to Shane Corson is that my dad hated the Montreal Canadians. Like, like so many dads, I guess I grew up in Northern Ontario. So it was, uh, you know, you know, half and half Leafs and, and half. Yeah. So when I was a kid, if I had, if I had played, you know, forget the skill part, if I even just had a little bit of Shane Corson grit, I think my dad would have been a lot easier on me on those car coaching rides home from practice and, and, and games. I think like you were a player that, um, Almost every dad would want their kid to grow up playing. When, oh, uh, when I appreciate that. I've, I've, had, I've had a few of those car rides too, Daryl. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> With my mom and my dad. I, I thought I'd get a little bit of soft landing from my mom, but uh, she was actually harder than my dad. So there were some interesting car rides. Yes. Sure. Where, yeah. where about Northern Ontario were you? I grew up in Sudbury. So not far oh, from nice. where, where you did in Barrie, or at least Barrie was Northern Ontario back then, or closer. It seemed more like Northern Ontario back then. Absolutely. I mean, I've been to actually been to Sudbury a few times. Uh, a couple of buddies of mine, Craig Duncanson and uh, the Crowder family. I played yep. junior with Troy Crowder, and I uh, got to know the family. So they're up in. Uh, I think it's Lively. They're they're yep. at, so been to yeah. Sudbury and Lively a few times. There you go. Well, I'm glad I got to work in Sudbury in one of our podcasts. Um, yeah. The uh, so we're going to start uh, like I mentioned right off the top. I consider you now a mental health advocate first. Um, you know, and a uh, and a former hockey player second, but it was your, your hockey career that, um, and a lot of people know you from, and I'm looking at an article from 2003, April, 2003. And it's the headline reads Corson resigns, uh, from Maple Leafs. <laughs> and, uh, it's interesting to, to read the article now, just the way we view mental health and different things and see kind of the subtle, uh, comments and and uh, the things that weren't said, but if you could take us through, like, you know, obviously that that's a pivotal moment in your life. So can you take us through? Can you take us through it a little bit? Yeah, it was probably uh, well, obviously the darkest days of my life and uh, one of the toughest days of my life. Uh, you know, I love the game of hockey. I love playoff time, and I love my teammates. And I played the game my whole life, but to to walk away from that was really, really tough. But I knew at that point that if I didn't, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you guys right now. So, I mean, it was a tough thing to do. And uh, like you said, a lot of people had different things to say and their opinions. But, uh, you know, when you don't know what's going on in somebody's head, or you don't know what's happening with them. It's it's easy to have your opinion. But until you know the truth, it's, uh, it's something that maybe you should uh, hold back on. But for me, it was the, the right decision. Obviously, like I said, if I, if I wouldn't have made that decision and walked away from the game that I love to play and get the help I needed to, I probably wouldn't be sitting here today because there was a lot of things going on in my mind and one, one being suicide. So I thought about that uh, many times uh, over the years. And um, like I said, it's the best thing I ever did because as soon as I left and uh, I spent a couple of days in my house by myself and obviously talking to my, my immediate family, but 
and they were aware of some of it, but not the whole the whole truth and exactly how bad it was. Uh, but luckily, I had that support. And then once I uh, started talking about it openly with everybody and getting the help that I needed to, I started feeling a lot better. It must have been Shane hard to navigate, like you know, the media and some of the comments after that, and they had no idea what was going on, and and. It's hard to read that because they don't know the story. And, and yeah, did you try to stay away from that and not pay attention to it and just focus on you, or how'd you manage? Yeah, well, that's that? that's exactly it, Chris. I mean, it, it was hard to read some of the stuff and, and see what they were saying and stuff like that, which was totally untruthful. But um, I talked to my family. I talked to uh, uh, my agent, actually, at the time, Rick Kern. And, you know, we, we decided not to say anything. We decided not make a comment. Just let let things be and worry about myself and get to get the help I need to get and to get better and. That was the most important thing was my health at that point. I really didn't care about uh, what other people were saying. And uh, and uh, I just wanted to focus, as you said, on myself for once. And finally, it took too long to, to do that. Uh, but yeah, that was that was exactly it. Um, but to, I'm not going to say that it didn't bother me, didn't hurt a bit. But I mean, the people that really know me and, and knew uh, kind of who I was and what I, what I, uh, the type of person I was, knew that I would not walk away from the game that I love to play. Uh, and for my teammates, and especially during the playoffs, unless it was uh, something that I needed to do. And as I mentioned, if I didn't do it, I really, truly believe I, I wouldn't be sitting uh, here today. But it was definitely a tough time. It was one of the darkest uh, times of my life. Uh, but it was the best decision I've ever made. I read somewhere that you described yourself always as an anxious child or a nervous child. Yeah. And, uh, and then you went through different points in life, um, you know, that – exacerbated your, your mental health issue. You, you lost your dad at a really young age, right? And uh, I mentioned when, before we started recording about the, your, uh, the article you did with The Athletic, uh, which is really great if anybody uh, wants to look it up, uh, where you kind of chronicle the loss of your father and not dealing with that grief and maybe a propensity for to be anxious. And then it, it just snowballing at, yeah. at that time. Like, and uh, as somebody who's lost their father, I like I read that and, and you know, and I lost my dad when I was 36 and I you know, lost your dad when you were like 27, I think, or something like late yep, 20s. Yep. yep. And uh, most of your friends would have already had their dads or still had their dads at that point or not suffered a lot of loss. Um, people wouldn't know how to talk to you. You must have felt incredibly alone in that point in your life. Yeah, I mean, uh, my my parents are, uh, you know, the, the one of the main reasons why I, I reached my goals and dreams of being a hockey player. I dreamed of being that and doing that for my whole life from being a young kid watching Hockey Night in Canada with my mom and dad. And they made so many sacrifices uh, for me to get to where I got to drive me to practice. Uh, they, they sacrificed buying things for themselves to, to buy me hockey gear so I could play hockey. And uh, my dad was like my best friend. He wasn't just my, my dad. He was my best buddy. He was 17 years old when I was born. So we were pretty close in age and we did everything together. And um, you mentioned it and I look back now and I didn't deal with the, the grief properly. I just kind of tried to move on and go on with my life and, uh, you know, take care of my mom and my sisters and, and my family. Uh, but you got to, uh, you got to take care of your grief and you got to grieve properly. And I, I didn't do that. Um, it was the hardest time of my life. Uh he was, a, he was my mentor. He was somebody that I looked up to. He was somebody that helped me with uh, my finances. He helped me with when I needed to talk to somebody about things that I was doing in business-wise, career-wise, family-wise, uh, personally-wise. And uh, I didn't have that anymore. And uh, it was a big loss for me. And uh, it was, like I said, the toughest thing that ever I went through. But you're you're 100% right. It, uh, I was an anxious kid uh, to start with. Uh, didn't like doing... Uh, uh, speeches in front of classes what during school so I'd be sick that day and not go to school and um, see there's things like that you need to try to face your demons and the things that you have to deal with and face them head on to 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 get better and to deal with them properly but definitely uh, got worse when my dad passed away uh, I just went back to playing hockey and tried to go on with my life and would cry and grieve on my own at nighttime but uh, you have to grieve as a family and, and do it properly to this day we still haven't buried my father he sits on my mom's mantle and I think that's uh something I was taught to uh when I finally got the help Dr. Shaw who was a big help with me taught me to go to you know find a place that was special for me that I could go sit there and talk to my dad and that's what I started doing and uh it it, it helped me a lot but um yeah you gotta you gotta learn you gotta grieve properly you gotta talk to people and you gotta do it together as a family and that's something that I didn't do and um 
like I said, just try to go on with my life and it wasn't uh, the, the right way to deal, deal with it. And then obviously you have other things in life. And everybody has people. People have things that go on in their lives. Uh, but you just have to learn how to deal with them. And that's something that I've learned from getting the help that I've got uh, with the doctors and uh, the psychiatrists and different things is that uh, it's okay not to be okay. I mean, you're going to have different emotions. You just got to know, have the tools and then and the mindset and understand what you're going through. And, and it's okay to cry. It's okay to be happy. It's okay to be down. Uh, that those things are going to uh, be part of your life and you just got to have the tools and, and the mindset to be able to deal with those things. And that's something that I learned over time, but obviously when you're going through life, there's a lot of life issues that happen. Uh, you do, you make some business mistakes. Uh, there's stresses of having a family. There's stresses of playing hockey, making decisions, you know, where you're going to, you're going to be with next or, and uh, then obviously the big one was for me, it was, uh, my career was coming to an end and, uh, you made it made me made a decision to leave Montreal, come to Toronto. And uh, like I said, it just and when you hide it and you don't talk to anybody about it and you feel alone, as you mentioned, I felt so alone when my dad passed away. Uh, like you don't have anybody, you're in a dark hole, you're gonna just not be able to come out of it. Um, that's what makes it snowball and it makes it tougher. And I learned that too over time is that the best thing you can do is talk about it. The worst thing you can do is not to talk about it and try to hide it and and deal with it on your own because you're supposed to be this big tough hockey player and um, it can touch anybody. I mean, I, I talked to so many people after I came out with it that uh, said, holy jump, and I never knew you were suffering from that, but I do too. And I never knew that person was suffering from it. Uh, people hide it in different ways. And, um, but yeah, talking about it for me is, uh, was the biggest thing. And that's why I left, left. I needed to, or I wouldn't be here today. So, you know, you talked about, it. I think it was 37 when you finally reached out for help, but yeah. when you're young, when you're a young person, you don't really have context to know what I'm going through is not normal or other kids or, yeah. you know, and so on reflection, do you ever look back and say, boy, I wish this was around. Oh, yeah. I was like, you know, whether it's speakers in schools or mental health people in schools, like, is there anything you can look back and say, if I had this, my trajectory might've been a little bit different. Oh yeah, Chris, for sure. I mean, I say that all the time. I wish I would have reached out and asked for the help a long, long time ago. I mean, just speaking for myself, I suffered for so many years and uh, in on my own, you know, right. Uh, and uh, it was the toughest thing. And you were afraid though. I was embarrassed or afraid. And, and I didn't have parents that would, my parents would have supported me through anything. They didn't, they, they, they would have, you know, I could have told them anything that I was going through and they would be there for me to support me. So it wasn't like it was because my parents would be ashamed of me or embarrassed or said it's tough enough or you can get through it or suck it up. I mean, uh, you know, my dad told me that a few times I was playing hockey, that I have a <laughs> bruise or something, just get suck it up and keep playing. Right. But um, you don't know how many times I've said to myself, I wish I would have reached out and got help a lot, a lot, a long, I got a lot longer ago because it's just something I get choked up just talking about. I can't even get my words out right now because I know there's so many people that are still not talking about it and they're suffering right now on their own. And you don't have to, you, you, you got to reach out. It's, it's makes it so much. Easier. And to be honest, the longer you let it go, the worse it's going to get. And then it's going to be harder to get yourself out of it. And, and trust me, you can get out of it no matter what stage you're at. Cause I was at the worst stage at the, at the very end of it. And uh, when I reached out and got the help, it, it turned around. I'm doing a lot better. It's something I deal with day to day, but I mean, the earlier you tackle it and get the help you need, uh, the, the sooner you're going to get better and uh, the easier it's going to be on the rest of your life. Cause I suffered with it for years and years and years, but uh, for sure. And I, I just think the, the stigma is getting better because more people are talking about it and people are more people are understanding about it. They, they understand it's, there's a lot of people that suffer with it. So uh, it's obviously a lot easier now than it was back in the day, but it's still, there's still a lot of room to improve with it. Just to circle back on your, your, the piece around your, your dad and grief. Um, I hope things have changed, but I remember, I mean, you were in a much different position when you were going through that and keeping it a secret. And when I went through it, like a lot of people, I'm, I worked in mental health. So I knew that I had to take care of it. Right. And yeah. I was, you know, and I actually was actively like seeking out um, services beyond like, you know, EAP and other uh, short-term solutions. Like I was like, whether there was a support group or anything like that. And like, I found for men, there wasn't that kind of stuff. Right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think we have a hard enough time talking uh, about our feelings as it is uh, in terms of, you know, the 100%. male species. Right. And then I agree with you. there was nothing. I found that I eventually found a couple books that resonated with me, but it, it was hard to find resources out there. Um, yeah. I don't know if that's changed or not, but I, hopefully it has. 
Well, it, it's definitely helped because of more people like you giving guys like me the platform and Chris to give the platform for me to talk about it and other people talk about it for sure. I know it's changed a lot within the NHL for sure. I mean, we have the NHL alumni, we have the NHL PA and we have good doctors around. That's, that's who helped me. That's who supported me on top of my family and, and a couple of my friends that understood, but it was the docs that, uh, that helped me. But that's something, see, when I start talking about my dad, I get lost. I almost black out because it's the suffering and the pain is still there and I'm, and I'm still grieving. I'll always grieve for him. But what I, what I learned and you, you mentioned it, I, I didn't really want to talk to my, my mom or my sisters about it. Cause I didn't want to, I didn't want to upset them any more than they already were. But in fact, if you talk about it amongst each other, it made it better. It made it easier. And now when we, we love talking about them and talking about it because it makes us smile and we have all those great memories of them that we can share together and, and we can help each other grieve and suffer through it. Whereas I just didn't really want to talk to them because I just didn't want to upset them or hurt them or see them cry at the time. Right. So I just would cry on my own at night. Uh, when I went back to Edmonton, I was playing at Edmonton at the time. And I just, I put some country music on cause him and I like country music and I just, cry, cry by myself and try to deal with it on my own. But now I realize and understand that it's, it's, um, uh, therapy and it helps all of us to sit there and have a good cry together and chit chat about it and talk about all the stories and all the great memories we have of them. And that's, that's what we hold on to now. And that's how we, how we deal with it, uh, better now, but for sure, you mentioned that there's better, uh, resources for, for speaking from a hockey player, ex hockey player. And I'm like you now, I, I care more about the mental health side of it and trying to help people than I do. Like hockey was great and I loved it and it was a, but it was a sport and uh, I was lucky to play it and make money at it, but helping people is far more important in life to me. And uh, so that's why I like doing it. But uh, there's far more resources now for the, for the NHL players now, but there's still, still a stigma there and we still got to keep working on it and uh, talking about it and improving that area for all people, not just professional athletes, but for all people, because it is, we're lucky we do have some resources there and there's other people out there that don't really have those. They have to go searching for them and look for them, but they are out there. Like there's the kids help phone, which is a great thing that I'm involved with. Cam H is a great uh, resource and there are people out there willing to help. And then there's people like us. I mean, I have people reached out to me that had a kid reach out to me today uh, that I don't know. He's from Boston and he read about my story and he said, is there a number I can reach you at? And I just, I actually felt bad. I feel almost like I have to, because I had help. So I, I'm going to talk to him tomorrow. And that's important. I mean, you got to put your hand out there, give somebody a hug or let them just talk for a bit. And I think that's, that's what we need to do. Shane, you mentioned something. I think it's really important. Um, you had mentioned that you, you moved on from your original psychiatrist. And so I, I think people don't, you know, it's not like a GP where they all give you sort of, you know, penicillin or antibiotics. Yeah. So it's so important to find the right clinician because you're, you're sharing intimacy and trust. And, and if you don't find the right person, you could be languishing in care. So I want to maybe talk a little bit about that, how important it is to find the right person to be able right. to, to move forward. Well, not only the right person, every, every, every treatment is a little bit different too. Uh, you know, sometimes medication works for some and just for a short period, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes uh, talking about it uh, uh, with people, uh, obviously talking about it, but with a certain person, it can affect you, as you mentioned, more or help you. And uh, I think it's just find the right treatment for every person. But getting back to what you, the question you asked, I just wanted to mention that, but the question you asked me is, it's so important. I mean, Dr. Shaw, who ended up looking after me, he's with the NHL uh, PA. He's just an amazing person. And I owe a lot to him, Dr. Foreman, Dr. Abels. I, like I said, I had a good support team, but he originally sent me to a psychiatrist here in Toronto and I went there and after 25, 30 minutes, I was in a major panic attack. I was having like an anxiety sitting there listening to him. Like he, he put me in a room and I was sitting about 20 feet from him. And like you said, you're talking about personal and intimate things. And I just felt like he was judging me. Like it was like a light was shining. I was being interrogated, not having and letting somebody have me talk to them and let that. And that's what they have to be. They have to be there to let you talk and, and understand it. And then kind of, give you a hug or a, a kiss or whatever. I don't care what it is, but just coddle you a bit, not interrogate you or make you feel uncomfortable. And uh, after that, I remember I, I cut it short and I just, I left and I called Dr. Shaw right away. And I said, doc, like I felt like I was being interrogated and uh, I, I can't go back there. And he, right away, he said, I understand totally. He was amazing. He goes, you know what? I'm going to deal with you on my own. You come and see me. Cause we had a lot of things in common same type of people. He lost his father and, uh, 
uh, he was an athlete growing up too, and had, had a, a really close family. So he said, you know, I'm going to take care of you. And as soon as I started sitting down with Dr. Shaw, we'd sit on the couch and we were like right beside each other. It was like, I was talking to my dad and I think that that's, you know, might've helped too. Right. And, uh, I just felt so comfortable and I could talk about anything. And he didn't judge me. I mean, I felt like I was being judged when I was sitting in that room, to be honest. And, uh, I just, I just said I wasn't going back and I had a major panic attack while I was in there and it went on for about two, three hours after. I remember sitting in the parking lot in my car going, I can't drive, but I called Dr. Shaw right away and he talked to me for about half an hour, 45 minutes. And then I ended up leaving there about half an hour after that. And then I started seeing him and everything, everything started going a lot better, but it's definitely so important to find the right person, the right, the right treatment for you. And it's going to be a bit different for everybody. Great. Uh, just speaking of of others, um, when I was talking about or looking up kind of different parts of your career and trying to prepare for today, I looked at the 1989-90 Montreal Canadiens. I don't know if this rings a bell with you or not, but the three leading scorers on the Habs that year were Stefan Riche, uh, depression, uh, Shane Corson, you were second, you, you know, obviously you battled with anxiety. Russ Cornell uh, was third. He'd lost his dad. Uh, yeah to depression and suicide. And then the penalty minutes leader was Todd Ewan on yep. that team. And all rings you know, a bell. Yeah. And I mean, obviously who knows what you guys were dealing with as, as teammates at the time. And, and, you know, I'm sure you weren't sitting around after games talking about your feelings, but oh. Stefan Riche, you know, was one that really resonated with me because he had a, he had a label in Montreal and, uh, yeah. you know, eventually went to New Jersey and, um, you know, it wasn't until after his career was over that he opened up about depression. But when, when you, I don't know if you suspected anything at the time, but like when he started speaking publicly, did it make sense as a former teammate of his of what maybe your interactions were with him once you learned what he was dealing with? Well, I, I, I'll tell you, I didn't know that he was dealing with that when we were teammates, when we were playing together and he was my line mate, uh, for the four years we were, we played together. We were line mates the whole time. And uh, he was a great line mate and he was a great teammate too. Um, Rich, uh, kind of did a lot, was more to himself though, kept to himself a lot more. And, and now I kind of look back and think, yeah, maybe I understand that a little bit more because I know, you know, people suffer in different ways and they hide and every, and most of the guys were hiding it back then. We did definitely didn't sit around talking about it. And, uh, Rich and I still talk to this day now. And, uh, we kind of, we obviously connected as line mates cause we had great seasons together, but we've actually connected even more after hockey because of the uh, depression and anxiety and panic attacks. And I mean, I suffered with all of it. I mean, it's all tied up into one. I was depressed uh, and had anxiety and panic attacks for sure too throughout my, my life, but it got worse with years, but we've connected since then because of that. And it's made us even closer than just being teammates. And I think he appreciates that I came out with and I talked about it and, and I appreciate that he talks about it and admits to what he went through too, because it, it's going to help other people feel more comfortable to come out and talk about it. And um, I give uh, a lot of kudos to him for doing that. Uh, obviously, Rusty, uh, I knew obviously what he had suffered with because of his father and that. We were close. Still talk to Rust to this day. Uh, he's a great person. And uh, I think he's uh, one of the nicest things that he ever said to me was that he's proud of me for coming out and talking about it because it's helping people. And his brothers too. I'm close to his brothers, Jeff and Bruce, great people. And they're big advocates of mental health too. And, you know, obviously with Todd Ewan, uh, I wasn't aware of anything that was going on with Todd at all. And like I said, most guys hide it anyways. Uh, one of the nicest people I've ever met in my entire life. Uh, one of the toughest guys I ever played with, but off the ice, he was a teddy bear. And most of those guys are. And then I, you know, I've dealt with a lot of other stuff. Uh, Wade Belak, another buddy of mine, you know, you would have never guessed that he was suffering uh, with, with uh, depression and mental health, but, um, I'll tell you right now, I wish we would have talked about it back then all together because mm -hmm. we could have helped each other because like I keep saying it, but I realize now that the best thing I ever did was start talking about it. And, uh, that's where I made my first step to go down that path, to be able to deal with it from day to day and, and see the hope at the end of the tunnel and the light at the end of the tunnel, because I was in a dark space, but I wish we would have talked about it as teammates. And I wish I would have known those guys were suffering with that because it might've made me feel a little bit better about talking about myself, but I could also help hopefully help those guys from suffering because that's what you do when you're, when you're on your own and suffering with it on your own, it's like you're alone and you're just in a dark hole and you don't think you're ever going to be able to get out of it. Well, I want to touch a little bit on culture. So, I mean, certain vocations have sort of their own internal culture where they feel like nobody knows what we go through. And I, you know, we see that in first responders or police that, yeah. if I, you know, 
if I, the peer piece is so important. And I know you mentioned reading about R Roberto Asuna sharing his anxiety. Is it, did it resonate more with you, like for athletes to hear other athletes as opposed to some of the general public? Because maybe the culture of hockey or sports is we're, we're kind of Teflon. We don't deal with the same things as the general public, or that's the, the misconception out there. But it, did that resonate more with you hearing from another athlete dealing with it? Yeah, for sure. Because I think, I, like you said, it's, it's changed, uh, you know, in recent years because more people are talking about it. But, but back in the day, I don't think people really understood that we were maybe depressed or having anxiety or because from the outside looking, looking in, you, you look at a guy that's, and why shouldn't I be happy? I'm playing a game I love to play and I'm getting paid to do it. Like really. So uh, most people wouldn't realize that we are suffering inside a lot because it seems like from the outside that we have a perfect life that you know, we're doing everything we love to do. And, uh, and on top of that, I would play hockey because I love the game and wouldn't even care if I got paid, but you know, we're lucky, lucky, so lucky. And that's something I've realized over the years that how, how lucky I was to play a game. I love to play and got paid to do it. So for people looking in, they think, Oh, they have a, you know, a great family, supportive family, great parents, great, great uh, sisters, wife and kids. And uh, you know, playing a game for fun and getting paid to do it. So they, they don't see the other stuff, but we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to be uh, the best we can be. And uh, then there's other things that people don't see, you know, as uh, Daryl mentioned from the outside, you don't see what's going on in somebody's head. Uh, they didn't maybe know that I lost my dad when I was 26 and he was my best friend and my mentor and took care of my finances and, you know, gave me a kick in the butt when I needed it or gave me a hug when I needed it or a kiss or whatever. Um, and they don't see that uh, you can you can make uh, bad decisions in a business dealing, or uh, you know you don't feel like you're 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 uh, playing as well as you should be playing. Uh, there's so many things that they don't, they don't see from the outside. So seeing another athlete and and sitting there and going, oh, I understand totally what you're going through because he's putting pressure on himself to do well. And there's also other things than just baseball or hockey. It's called life, and there's so many things in life that can. Uh, get you down or or get you up and that's what i mean that's another thing i've learned is that emotions are part of life you're going to be up and down you just got to learn how to to uh, manage them properly but yeah definitely for sure and it, it actually helps it helps me too to see that other people are coming out uh, and talking about other athletes just to show people that we are just human beings and we do suffer just like everybody else and uh but but we feel lucky that we were lucky to to do something we love to do and get paid to do it yeah mm -hmm. daryl knows i kind of I ask almost this question all the time when we have yeah. hockey players on, but I, you know, I was so offended at the time when, you know, around the B lock and the, and the boo guard that it seemed like if somebody is suicidal or depressed, it had to be because they had head trauma and it yeah. sort of, and it doesn't mean that they didn't have those things, but it really right. dismissed the notion that you could be just like me or anybody else in society. Right. I, I agree with you. I mean, I know there's a lot of talk about the concussions and the head, uh, you know, uh, injuries and stuff like that. And it's, it's causing a lot of this stuff, but I mean, I was having anxiety and, 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 and panic attacks long before, uh, I had any serious head injuries. And, and I know there, it's important to take care of that side of it too. I'm not saying that because, you know, the guys have lives after they've finished playing sports for sure. But, uh, I mean, it's, it's a lot more than that. There, it's definitely a, an illness. And I believe that, uh, those guys might have suffered with uh, with uh, depression or anxiety or panic attacks, uh, even if they didn't, uh, you know, have the, the head trauma that they had. Uh, it might have added to it, might have made it worse. I don't know. Who knows? Uh, I'm not a doctor. I don't pretend to know all that stuff. But, uh, yeah, it, it, it bothered me a bit, too, to be honest, because they were just everybody wants to just sort all it's from the head trauma, uh, head trauma they've had. Right. Where it could have been just something that they've gone through in their lives that, uh they had a hard time dealing with and uh, it put them in that state. Chris mentioned uh, Roberto Asuna uh, and, you know, you're, you're kind of rising up during that time to, to talk about your own experience. But the first time I actually remember you sharing your story was something that came across on a Jays game. Uh, the Reds were in town. Yeah. Uh, Joey Votto it was the first time I ever remember a, a player being listed on the, at that time, they called it the disabled list, but basically the injury reserve uh, with a mental health issue. It was yep. actually listed like Joey, Joey Votto out with anxiety. And uh, they were, they were sharing a story on the broadcast about Dusty Baker, the Reds manager at the time, who was, you know, uh, probably considered an old school guy 
yeah. having a uh, lunch at one of your restaurants and yeah. you guys talking about your own experience. So can you tell us a bit about that story? And I mean, you talk about changing lives or changing people's perspectives, but, but here's a guy who, you know, he didn't experience mental health, but he probably had a lot of stigmatizing views on it. And you were able to kind of change his, his mind just in a casual conversation one day. Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a very interesting story, actually. I never, ever brought it up to anybody. It's, uh, and you know what? The funny thing is, I never even knew they talked about that in the broadcast. <laughs> but um, how it happened, actually, I was at home and my buddy of mine, that, uh, it was his restaurant, uh, actually. I had just invested some money in it. And he said, Dusty Baker's down here. And he was talking to him about some mental health stuff and things like that. And he said, you know, would you mind coming down here to talk to him? So I got my car, went down and talked to him. And then I found out that, uh, you know, one of his players was uh, suffering with mental health and uh, anxiety and a lot of similar things that uh, that I was going through at, uh, or had gone through and was still going through. I, I go through it every day. I have to deal with it every day. But so I went down there and had a conversation with him. I spent like probably half an hour with him. And um, yeah, he was more uh, understanding, I think, I would say, by the end of the conversation. And uh I actually started having conversations with, uh, with Joey and I talked to Joey on the phone for probably, and I've never met the guy in my life other than on the phone. I talked to him for quite a, quite a while, probably over a year on the phone, just about anxiety and panic attacks. When he was going through it, he just gave me a call and say, look at him having a bit of a tough time. And we talk about it and it makes me feel pretty good that I helped the guy. He's a, here's a guy that's one of the best baseball players around a Canadian and he's suffering with the same thing I am. And uh, I was able to help him uh, help him get through it. So it was, uh, it was a great feeling for me to be able to help somebody, and uh, especially uh, another uh, like a colleague, another athlete. Because sometimes, like we've mentioned throughout this, us us athletes uh, sometimes uh, are a little embarrassed or shy or or even scared to losing our jobs to reach out and ask for help. And that's sometimes the toughest thing to do. And I thought it was pretty cool. Dusty asked me to come down there and then mention it to Joy. And then Joy reached out to me and we, we spent some time together on the phone and still haven't met him, but uh, he's doing, doing a lot better, I, I assume. And actually met his mom. His mom runs a restaurant, I think, out in the Tobacco area. I think it was there. I can't remember the name of it. I know they had a good wine list, though, but uh, <laughs> met her. She was a, a super lady. And he, he, he lost his father, too. And uh, some different things went on in his life that uh, he probably hadn't dealt with properly either. Uh, with the grief and stuff properly either. So yeah, it was pretty cool. It was a pretty cool conversation with Dusty. And uh, I mean, I was just happy that I could help Dusty understand it a little bit better and uh, to help Joy. I think that's the biggest part that made me feel good. Shane, you mentioned, I mean, your parents, if they had not known, would have done anything that's to support you. And, and now that you have sort of this knowledge and reflection, it, was that something you talked to your own kids about? Like, I'm here, if anything, like, are you more in tune to, to yeah, behaviors I, and having that conversation. Yeah. People ask me that a lot. I mean, because just because you've gone through it, you do, you, it's, you can't always tell if you're, you're one of your kids is suffering from it or another person suffering because people hide it so well mm-hmm. that you always can't tell, tell their, they are having issues, but you, you said it right there is that I just try to say to them that if they're ever having anything or any problems with mental health, we're open and ready to talk. Or if you don't feel like talking to us, uh, we have contacts that you can, call somebody and get the help you need. And uh, funny you say that is I have four kids, three girls and one boy, and two of them suffer with uh, mental health and anxiety and panic attack and depression. My son, Dylan, he's uh, 27. He suffers with it. And then my youngest daughter who plays at Boston College hockey, she suffers with it pretty badly too. So they've both uh, got help with doctors. And the funny thing is they prefer to talk to, uh, uh, you know, the people that we've set them up with uh, than myself or, or my wife. So, what you try to do is just tell them that if they ever need anything, we're here to talk. If they want to talk, we're here. And uh, if they need somebody else to talk to, we have the, the, the uh, resources and the people that we can reach out to. And, and again, though, Chris, we said, uh, you know, Willow reached out to one person to talk to that person for a couple of times and it just wasn't working right. It wasn't connecting Daryl mm-hmm. and Chris. And uh, so she reached out to somebody else and she hit it off. And uh, that's who she mm-hmm. talks to now. And um you just have to be supportive and be there. Like sometimes if you push too hard, uh, it doesn't work either. Cause I kind of tried to do that with my son at first because I said, come on, talk to me. I've been through it. I I'm going through it still. I deal with it. Every, I know what 
you need to do, but I didn't really, because everybody's different. As we talked earlier, everybody needs different help and needs to do it in their own way. They have to find their way that makes them feel good. And, uh, I realized that, uh, after a while. And, uh, with my daughter, I knew right away how to deal with it. Just that we're here for you. If you want to talk about it, we're there. If not, we'll, uh, we'll find the help you need. Just let us know. That's basically how we did it. Perfect. Definitely in tune with, I'm more, way more understanding and, and, uh, like people hide it so well you it's hard to tell but you sometimes you think maybe he's suffering or but but i just think i'm more open to it and understanding about people's feelings and emotions and, and moods i mean like sometimes you would think oh that guy's always in a terrible mood or he's he's crabby or he's bitchy or he's uh, he's a bit of an ass he's cr- like always crumpy but then you realize well now i realize no that's maybe he's suffering or dealing with something so you give him a little love instead of giving it back to him a bit about and being a little bit harder on him or or having an opinion about them, you maybe just give them a little love and then you realize that uh, that can change a lot. Mm-hmm. Just giving a little bit of support and some love to somebody, it can help them a lot. Absolutely. Yep. Before, you know, before we wrap things up with you, Shane, I, you know, even though you've been out of, you know, the NHL for, for a time now, yep. you've been, you, you're still very connected to hockey, you know, whether it's the alumni events when, when we could do those kinds of things, yeah, but even, yeah. even with your own kids and their, you know, hockey careers, um, how do you think how, like hockey culture and like has changed in terms of being able to have these conversations and, and then how far, how much further would you like to see it go? Well, I, I love hockey. I love the game of hockey and it has changed a lot on and off the ice. I mean, um, these kids are unbelievable skilled. They, they work out differently than we did. They eat differently than we did and they have a lot more resources because of the guys and and I had more resources than the guys in the seventies because of the guys in the seventies and these kids have more resources because of us and, and the, and the ownerships and the league, the NHL itself, the NHL PA, the alumni, they understand that they have to be taken care of. It's a business now too. There's a lot of money involved. So they have to take care of these kids. And I think they have uh, better resources and they, than they deserve it. They need it. Um, but I still think there's a long ways to go. I mean, there's still people hiding in the, uh, in the dark, and not willing to come out and talk about it because they're afraid of losing their job or showing weakness or, or so many different things, embarrassment. Uh, but I say to that, that don't be embarrassed and don't be shy and don't be scared, afraid to lose your job or, or anything like that. Because I think it's changed that way. Like when people reach out for help nowadays, they get the help they, they need in the NHL for sure. And uh, I think that's amazing, but there's still, there's still a ways to go to let the, these kids know and these and, and people know that, it's okay not to be okay. It's, it's, you're, you're not, uh, it's, it's an illness. You're not, it's not a weakness. Right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, um, so I, I think there's still some room to go and, uh, but we're going in the right direction for sure. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that's exciting, but there's so much more we need to do and we have to do Uh, Cause I still see like a lot. I still hear some horror stories about guys that, uh, played before me that didn't make the kind of money that some of us made and they're suffering uh you know you get out of hockey and that's the only thing they knew how to do and they're not doing things they don't know how to do anything else and uh, the money doesn't last forever and then they end up turning to different things i did i turned to alcohol and stuff like that and out of van and these guys turn to different things and i think there needs to be a little bit more help for those guys i mean the kids that are playing nowadays hopefully they're smart and they have teams around them financial guys and all that stuff they're helping them put their money in safe, good spots because they'll be set up for the rest of their lives if they do that. Where the guys before us, they didn't make a lot of money and they a lot of them before me were working jobs too on top of that. So I wish there was more for the for the old older players. I mean, I'm an old timer now too. I'm 55, <laughs> but I'm talking to the guys before me. I just wish there was a little bit more support there for them financially and, and, and on top of that uh, with the doctors and all that stuff for sure. Well, Thanks a lot, Shane, for joining us. Uh, people want to find out what you're doing or what do you have anything, do you have any events? I guess you don't have any events because there's not, not much going on, but <laughs> yeah, if there's uh, anything we can promote or anything, please let us know. And uh, it's been great talking to you about your mental health story, about your story as a person and also mixing some hockey and lots of fun. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Thanks, Daryl. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. I, I mean, just follow me on Instagram. You know, my Instagram uh, handle, it's mm-hmm. Shane Corson 27. And, uh, my son's uh, got a drink, uh, uh, alcohol company called Good Sunday. So, and I'm a, I'm a small investor in that. So I'm involved in that. So it's good. So that's, like you said, we're not doing a whole lot of events and I miss those events because 
I miss being in touch with people and getting personal with them and, and uh, being around people and just talking to other than my kids and my wife, they're ready for me to get out of the house or do some events, <laughs> but uh, just trying to stay safe and strong for everybody else out there and keep everybody healthy. And I just want to thank all the, uh, all the people out there that are doing so, so many great things with COVID-19. It's not just the nurses and the doctors, which they're doing an amazing job, but it's the grocery store people and the delivery people and everything like uh, pharmacy people. I could go on and on, but I just want to thank everybody for everything they're doing, but, and we're trying to do our part by staying in, but I, I miss the events. I'll look forward to being able to go out and uh, for a good cause and raise money for you know, people that need it. And still it gives me a chance to talk about my story. And then it also gets me back on the ice once in a while where I'd like to be still once in a while. So yeah. it's a win-win for me. So I miss all that, but we have to do what we have to do to keep, uh, keep everybody as healthy as possible and get through this, uh, this darn thing. Cause it's, it just brings mental health out to even the forefront more with, uh, what everybody's going through. It's hard on everybody. I know it's not easy. So everybody's just got to stay safe and stay strong and do the best they can. And if you're feeling down, there's a, there's a, resources out there reach out to anybody or uh, a different program and get the help you need because I, I believe me you can get through it and uh, you can get better for sure well thanks again Shane Thank great you. time really enjoyed talking to you and all the best uh, thanks guys I really appreciate you having me Daryl and Chris and all the best to you guys and thanks for giving me this platform to talk about my uh, my personal situation and about hockey a little bit it brings back some memories so I appreciate it and if you ever want me back on again, I'm more than happy to come back on the talk more.